Hello and welcome back to another episode of Marriage in a Tightrope. I'm Alan. And I'm Katie. And we're, we're still married and obviously married. not in sync. <laughs> You'd think after two and a half years we'd have this right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but we don't. We're so excited to be joined by Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife once again. Thanks for joining us again. Yeah, my pleasure. You know, we're going to introduce you real quick and then we'll get right into the episode. If you have not listened to the first episode, first of all, with with Dr. Finlayson Fife, it's absolutely worth the time and effort. And I was going to say the time and money, but there's there's no money involved. But you could go back and listen to that. It's fantastic. (laughs) But for those that uh, have not listened or not familiar with Dr. Finlayson Fife, uh, she is a relationship and sexuality educator and coach, as well as a licensed clinical professional counselor in Illinois with a PhD in counseling psychology from Boston College. Fighting tartans. I don't know what their mascot is. Anyway, she wrote a dissertation on LDS women and sexuality has taught college-level courses on human sexuality and currently teaches online relationship and sexuality courses and live workshops to LDS individuals and couples. She offers coaching services to individuals and couples who have benefited from her podcasts and courses and are looking for more direct input on improving their lives and relationship. She is a frequent contributor on the subjects of sexuality, relationships, and spirituality to LDS-themed blogs, magazines, and podcasts, including what you may be familiar with, with the Ask a Mormon Sex Therapist podcast series. She maintains a private coaching and counseling practice in Chicago, where she lives with her husband and three children, and she is an active member of the LDS Church. Welcome back. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> so like Katie was telling you before we started recording, uh, this this topic that we're talking about today is, is often one of the most mentioned issues, topics of discussion mm-hmm. with mixed faith uh, couples, and that is garments. Mm-hmm. So Katie, I'm going to, I've kind of done the introduction. I'm going to pass the baton over to you, not only because you are still a garment wearer, <laughs> but also because you're amazing, and I have to leave in 20 minutes. So when I disappear halfway through the episode, <laughs> listeners don't don't feel like I ran away because I was sad or something. I ran away because mm-hmm. I was busy. So mm-hmm. go ahead. So I just want to start by saying, you know, this is top topic for a lot of our listeners. And, mm-hmm. you know, it is a especially difficult tender for people to negotiate with their spouse. Why is it so difficult to see your spouse stop wearing the garments or to negotiate something like this? You know, there may be a lot of individual reasons that I won't capture in this, but I think that first of all, it's an important symbol of belief and devotion. The garment is. And so it's kind of a a signifier of the fact that you're in the fold and that you pay a kind of deference and offer a seriousness to the expectations of the faith. And so I think to see someone step out of compliance sometimes has less to do with the fact of the coffee, for example, or the fact of not wearing garments as it is about that emblematically it signifies that you're no longer kind of in a similar relationship to the faith that I hold dear or the life perspective that I hold dear. And so it can feel threatening because there's a different orientation that's getting exposed through the issue of whether or not one wears garments. Do you feel like that garments, you made the comparison, not comparison, but you mentioned coffee as well. Do you feel like garments can be particularly more triggering or difficult because of the tie to the temple and the tie to marriage within the temple where a shedding of the garments do couples sometimes feel like that is a shedding of the marriage as well, or a threat to the marriage more so than a cup of coffee would be. I think so. And I don't know if I entirely know why, but I think when I'm working with mixed faith couples in my, in my coaching practice that oftentimes they can handle the idea of their spouse, not paying tithing, or even, you know, drinking coffee more than taking off the garment. And I'm not, I don't know if I really understand why, but, you know, it may have something to do with the relationship to the temple, but also maybe it's linked to sexuality in some way. Maybe a fear that if you stop wearing 
garments that you're sort of liberating something about your embodiment and your sexuality that feels scary to me. And, and I don't know. I, I think probably listeners would say, no, that's not it for me. There's some other piece of this that I don't quite yet understand from my own experience with couples. But I think it may be linked to the issue of sexuality um, as well. Yeah, I am nodding my head because one of the first things I thought when Alan took off his garments was, is he just going to go have Doesn't an affair? Doesn't he look good? Oh, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was not a- that was the second thought. Uh, no, I just, I thought like, well, you're breaking those covenants, mean, which means like now you, you probably feel like you can go and have sex with anyone or, yeah, you know, and it absolutely was that for me. Sure. That, that makes sense to me. Cause I think, you know, especially the way that I was growing up as an adolescent, I really had this feeling that if you weren't sort of obeying and kind of stepping within into the system of expectations, that then it was just a slippery slope into debauchery. I mean, that was, I kind of saw all my non LDS high school friends as, you know, on that spiral down in a way. And so I think a lot of us have that feeling that if you let go of this deference or obedience paradigm, that then there's no anchors. And especially in a marriage, you may can handle it if your brother does that or something. But in a marriage, I think it can feel much more threatening and much more personal. Yeah, it absolutely feels much more personal. Mm-hmm. How do we go about maybe talking or encouraging healthy differentiation when we no longer really look alike, right? As far as the garments go, mm-hmm. I, are there boundaries that come with that? How do we talk about it? Well, I think in a healthy couple, there is an effort to make room for how one is in their integrity, even if it's different from how you are. And even if in some sense it invalidates who you are, you know, when you're doing right by your spouse, you are supportive of them living up to who they want to be in the world, living up to their better self and not looking just for reinforcement. What I think we're wired to do is to want in the name of love for a spouse to reinforce who we are and how we see things. And so, you know, the devout member of the church may find the Haynes briefs unattractive in part because it, it, it symbolizes a step away from the values that he or she holds dear. The non-garment wearer may look at the garments and think this is a kind of barrier to my partner. It's a, they're sort of still deferring to something that I don't find valuable. And so I think it's unattractive because it's an invalidation of me. I think that's a typical response. And I think a better response is I may not like their underwear choice, um, but I want to be strong enough to claim my own position and allow them to sort out their position and to love them as a whole person, even in the ways that they don't reinforce me. It seems like a lot of these difficult negotiations just all point back to those healthy communication. And uh, this one doesn't have to be more difficult. It's, it's, but, but it certainly can be yeah. <laughs> for many couples. Mm-hmm. So that will resonate with a lot of people, right? Especially the post-Mormon mm-hmm. feeling like there's a barrier there between them mm-hmm. and their spouse. And mm-hmm. we've seen, especially in, in the, uh, among post-Mormons, that they can feel triggered by seeing their spouse in garments. And mm-hmm. it becomes a mental health issue when their spouse wears them and they see them. Uh, what are the negotiations that a couple can do can you order. say more about that when you say a mental health issue? Like, say that feels a little like a cop out to me, but say what you yeah. mean. Yeah, yeah. So we've had a number of of couples tell us that the post Mormon spouse will express that seeing the garment is triggering to them, 
produces anxiety. It produces anxiety. They have depression. Now that may not be the cause of it, but that's a trigger for them, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, especially when they're when they're um, in like a really angry phase. Mm-hmm. And so they feel sometimes the right to say to their spouse, you, you shouldn't be wearing the garments while I'm feeling yeah. triggered by these. And I mean, is this, uh, is that valid for, <laughs> for the spouse? I'm just wondering, like, how do these negotiations? I mean, my happen? general, it's a good question. And, and I'll say my general response is no, it's not legit, but I'll be a little more compassionate than that. So let me <laughs> I mean, I get a little triggered by the idea of people getting triggered. And the reason why, the reason why I I do is not that I don't believe that people can get triggered. I I mean, but I feel like sometimes we use the idea of triggering to control other people rather than learning to self-regulate and to control ourselves. And so this could go either way. We talked about this a little bit in the first podcast, which is I'm triggered by you not wearing garments. Therefore you have to wear them. I have one couple I was working with where that's absolutely true. You know, he'd been out of the church for a long time. And basically there was this tyranny of, I get triggered when you don't wear them. So for years, he's wearing them when he doesn't believe just to, because there's this kind of marital demand. And I think that's indulgent. And then of course it can go the other way, which is, here's, here's where I'm calling out where I think it's not fair. And then I'll, and then I'll go to where maybe there's fairness in it. You know, I, I can't stand it. Uh, I am upset. I'm angry. Therefore you can't do it. And I, I think that it's always a weak position to say, I can't be stable and I can't be decent unless I can control you. And a lot of us use a victim position to control others. And it's always a weak position because we're trying to control others rather than ourselves, And in a sense, we're giving away our own power to manage our lives. It's not unusual in marriage. Believe me, most of us get married with the goal of controlling the other person into our happiness (laughs) (laughs) rather than loving somebody who's really different than us. Where I guess I would say I have some compassion for it is that the issues around faith are big issues. And especially when someone goes through a faith transition, the couple, if, especially if one person is shifting in their belief, both people are supercharged because something's crumbling that has defined the marriage, has been an anchor point in the marriage. And the issues of whether or not you attend church, wear garments, drink coffee, all those things are, are high meaning issues. And so they're dysregulating, they're upsetting especially somebody, let me kind of give credit to each position. I mean, to somebody who's become disillusioned, who feels like they're losing a great deal to see their spouse wear the garment is in a way saying you still choose the church. You don't choose me. And there's something there, there at least often is something absolutely legitimate about that. And it hurts. It's like, you don't want to deal with what I'm saying. You don't want to deal with what I'm experiencing. You just want the sort of safety of your position. And and sometimes that's true. The garment can sort of symbolize that disloyalty, for lack of a better word. Um, I don't mean that loyalty is go see things the way your spouse sees them, but is it about I'm just kind of wrapping myself up in my my faith and ignoring you? Or is it, you know, this person sees my point of view, doesn't see life the same way and is choosing differently. I think on the other side, you know, the fair thing is it's hard to see my spouse not wear garments because it, we got married on a set of assumptions. It's all falling apart. I don't know where this ends. Is this just the beginning of you stepping away from me? Is this just one way of you belonging to yourself? Which one is it? And it's so overwhelming that I can barely handle seeing you over there in your underwear, no matter how good you look. (laughs) So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So another piece of the puzzle is just feeling physically attracted to your spouse when they're wearing Mm -hmm. garments. And it's no, it's no secret that garments are not sexy. I mean, this Mm -hmm. is how it is, right? Mm -hmm. So... (laughs) So for they those, need to have women get in on the design team. Right? But yeah, I, mm-hmm. I totally agree. Um, so what 
what strategies can we use if we aren't feeling sexually attracted to our spouse because of the garments and they're, they feel like it is a barrier? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things. One is that the, the meaning of these issues is often part of the, yes, I concur that garments are not sexy, but the meaning can also be very unsexy. If you feel like this person sort of is choosing safety and choosing kind of a, a, a narrow view and not choosing me, that can make it all unattractive. If people can be at peace with, look, we do it differently. We see this differently. We're in relationship to our worldview and faith differently. And I can respect that she or he is going to do this differently than me, even if I don't like it. Then I think it's less supercharged. Um, but you can also still negotiate. I think that, uh, you know, I know a lot, a lot of couples that I've worked with where, you know, the garment wearer will, you know, let's say it's the woman, will put on lingerie. I mean, she'll put it on earlier in the day. She'll walk past him and, and let him sort of see that she's not, that she's in lingerie. Like they can use the kind of news of a difference as a kind of way of flirting and playing in a different meaning. And so, again, one of the, if you can diffuse this, the, the, the fact of difference, then I think you can negotiate how do you bring your sexuality. See, because I think somebody, you know, I've thought about this a lot, especially over the last few years, is that people relate to faith in different ways. And one of the ways that many of us relate to faith, but I think is less mature, is in the idea that if I check the boxes, if I do the things that I'm being asked to do, it's a kind of insurance policy against vulnerability. It's an insurance policy against exposure in the world. And so I'm doing it because I want to buy into that worldview. And I don't want to kind of take deep responsibility for myself and my choices. So I think if you have a spouse that's kind of staying in that kind of dependency, that can have a different meaning and a different read on attractiveness than somebody who's relating to faith in a stronger way, which is this is a community and a set of principles that really push me to live up to my better self. Wearing garments is a kind of way of me honoring my commitment to God and my integrity in the kind of person I want to be. And it's important for me because it helps me to live up to my higher self. It, you know, I think that's much more respect worthy. And if it's really coming from that place of self-definition and integrity, I think you can be like, oh, I don't care for the style of it, but I can respect you. I see you as a strong person and an able person who's deliberately making choices, even if you do it differently. I think that's easier to settle down around. Let's go back to the flirting. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> the sexy underwear part. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped listening about 120 seconds. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, it, you know, it, it, one of the questions we wanted to ask actually came up because of uh, that example that you gave with the lingerie of, and this may be more of a question for sister Finlayson Fife than Dr. Finlayson Fife, but you know, how involved should ecclesiastical leaders be or how involved should we invite them to be maybe is a better question when it comes to negotiating these types of things with garments. Is there a concern? Uh, is this more of a personal question, I guess, of, you know, is this, if you're not wearing them, is that, that going to pose a problem and answering the temple recommend question, honestly, for example? Well, I think, you know, clearly people have to sort out uh, where they think their responsibility lies. Is it in proving to a bishop that I'm doing this in the right way? Or is it my own integrity and my own relationship to God that I'm doing this in a way that has integrity in it? You know, I lean towards the personal integrity position, which is, it's between me and God, right? And that I don't want to be dishonest or misrepresent myself, but this is not, uh, this, this is about whether or not I'm living up to my promises and to who I have just chosen to be and how the garments fit into that. So it's, 
you know, the, the question is, do you wear garments day and night, not every day and every night? It's not, I don't, I don't think it's mature of us culturally to imagine that we must have some kind of checklist that seems more superstitious and fear-based than am I in relationship to my covenants and commitments in a way that I'm really living my best, living up to my higher self. Because if you are, then you're going to be loving and open-hearted, not fear-based. You're going to navigate uh, a relationship to spiritual markers and, and uh, reminders in a way that help you live in an open-hearted, loving way in your relationships. So, I mean, I think we really struggle with this sometimes culturally, and Christ was very clear about it, is the idea, you know, the Sadducees and the Pharisees wanted all the markers of religiousness to indicate goodness. And Christ was saying, no, it's, it's how you love. It's who you are that indicates your spiritual development, not the, not the behaviors that are there to support that development. Or when Christ said, you know, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Garments were made for our spiritual development. We weren't made to wear garments. <laughs> and so if you're thinking about who am I in relationship to these practices in a way that make me more able to love, more able to extend myself, to push myself to be better, to be more open-hearted, less fear-based, more courageous, more faithful in the true sense of the word, or am I using it to kind of hunker down, look for reinforcement, take a self-righteous position? How am I in, it's not whether or not you wear them. It's how you're in relationship to that covenant and that, that perspective that really is the measure. Could we petition for a 13th member of the quorum of the 12? And I love that. Thank you for saying that. I just had a light bulb moment there because when you were talking, I thought to myself, I actually screamed in my brain, then why are we so judgmental towards each other? Right? Especially women. When we see someone not wearing the garments, we want to call them out. Mm -hmm. And I've totally done it. And I mm -hmm. know... I know others who have done it too, but you just answered it. It's because we are so hunkered down in the markers rather than the love. Alan's walking mm -hmm. in the door as I say this. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the episode. <laughs> um, yeah, we're so we're so hunkered down and, and so worried about what everyone else is doing instead of just worrying about how we are with the Lord, how we are yeah. practicing self compassion and and self love and and our own integrity. Right. And I think there's maybe two reasons for that. I think for one is it's that as human beings, we love reinforcement. So we like hanging out with people who see things the way we see them, who tell us we're so right whenever we share our perspective, who do the things that we do. And so it's when you see good people doing things differently than you do, it's uncomfortable because it maybe puts your own choices into some question and maybe stretches your perspective on things. And so it's easy to just judge and kind of um, invalidate instinctively the differences we see in other people. I think the other piece of that can be, I mean, we really have to watch ourselves when we start getting all judgmental because it means we're insecure about something usually. Because uh, I think what it also can be is if we're in that, you know, when I talked about sort of two ways we relate to faith, if we're more in the superstitious position, which is do all the things, well, a lot of times if you're doing that, you kind of recognize you're giving up a lot of things with the hope that you're going to get a reward in the next life or that you're getting protected from the vulnerabilities of life. But there is a sense often that you're giving up a lot. So if you see other people not giving up the same things and they seem to be getting away with it, <laughs> Well, there's sort of an instinct to want to judge it harshly because it's maybe casting doubt on your own choices. And I think it's instinctive to judge rather than maybe use it as an opportunity to look at our own choices and say, am I at peace with my choices? And if so, why? And if not, why not? And what do I need to address with myself? But it's always easier and feels better up front to judge others. And so it's a very human thing to do. It's not LDS. It's human. You know, we all do it. 
it's human. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's also human for uh, sometimes someone with someone like me anyway, for me to feel like a martyr. Right. And, yes. You know, play that card in, in, absolutely. in respect with all of it. So, yep, Absolutely. I think we are kind of like done with the garment questions and I'd love to ask a couple more, um, mm-hmm. especially related to faith, mixed faith marriage. I think some of the previously held values or things that you've been told um, when you're a member of the church, I'm going to give mm-hmm. a specific example, like pornography, um, mm-hmm. you know, they, we, we kind of learned to stay away from it. And so mm-hmm. when a spouse goes through a faith transition, they may want to renegotiate some of the things that they used to think were bad and mm-hmm. no longer believe are bad. So I, I think that pornography is a huge one mm-hmm. and in, in the marriage. So yeah. what kind of um, counsel would you give on navigating these new ideas about, you know, sexual practices being introduced into your marriage? You know, what, what's the damage that can be done? One thing is that I think in any healthy marriage, you're going to, if you, if you have two people that are actually showing up genuinely, whether or not one has left the church, there's going to be invalidating realities that are inherent to the fact of an honest marriage. That is to say, a spouse is going to believe and want things in a way that you don't agree with. You just take, take COVID, for example. <laughs> like, you know, couples are going to often orient differently to how much risk one is willing to take, how much of a threat it is, what one's responsibility is. And so just, you know, as one of many, many ways in which couples can differ in their perspective, the fact of invalidation is inherent to marriage. When there's a faith transition, then it kind of, that what was sort of a, at least agreed upon frame now has broken you know, so it's no longer the shared frame. And so it's going to open up new possible points of invalidation around sexuality. I think that in an immature version of this, you basically will do, which is to to be self-righteous about the legitimacy of your perspective without being willing to look at and understand the perspective of the other. So you either use the self-righteousness of how dare you even talk to me about this. It means that you're an illegitimate person that you even want to renegotiate some of the terms or that pornography is even something you would think about or from the self-righteous position of you're so narrow and rigid in your sexuality. And, you know, it's just about your fear. You should consider what I'm saying and, or do what I'm saying. And so those are both, immature positions because there's no it's about shaming versus trying to at least understand where are you coming from what is it that you're looking for what is it that you want here's what my fear is either the fear that this will become a marriage where there's no boundaries or the fear that this will always be a boring marriage sexually that might be the fear on either side And so what I think a strong couple does is they are willing to be honest, but they're not trying to hijack the other person. They're trying to create something that truly works for two people that doesn't undermine either party and makes the couple stronger because there's a basic friendship there. And anybody that's wanting to prioritize their own adventure over a partnership is going to pay, uh, they'll pay through the uh, unhappiness in the sexual relationship or somebody who prioritizes their sense of safety over a sexual friendship will pay in the sexual relationship suffering. So I know I I sound a little bit nebulous because I'm not saying here's the answer. This is always the right thing because it depends on what one is doing in their respective position. So would you suggest someone, a couple who are in kind of that immature state just to look, seek for counsel or help? How do they work on that to become more mature in their thinking or in their relationship building? Yeah, I think, you know, I think that 
the biggest thing in a marriage is dealing with what kind of a partner you are and what it would be like to be with you and how much you basically pressure either you don't attend to your own desires sufficiently for the marriage to be strong or you're pressuring the other person to conform to your shape. That's always going to work against the marriage being something that's strong, that's coming from two solid people, even if different. So what, so a lot of times people get focused on the issue of porn, for example, or the issue of sexual inhibition, rather than how are we handling the fact of difference here? And is this a respectful partnership? Are we being willing to be challenged by the most honest self of the other? So what you do is you go and you look for a good marriage therapist or coach who's willing to help you see your own immaturity who's willing to help you see where you need to either stand up and be stronger and be more solid in your own point of view. If you defer too much or you accommodate too readily, like some people are like, Oh, I better look at porn because that way my spouse won't leave me. And, but that's not an integrity position, you know, or do you have to look at that? You bully too much. You demand too much. You think things should be your way because you're more enlightened or you're more spiritual. So those are the core issues that are much more important than the specifics that are getting negotiated by the couple. And so when you do get into the specifics, is it fair to have boundaries for both of you? Is that healthy? Is that something that you should be setting up? Well, help me know what that means when you ask that. So for example, um, this is a, a couple decides one, one partner decides they're both respectful to one another, but one really wants to try a, like a polyamorous. Would you mm-hmm. say they're not being respectful for each other? Um, but the other partner is saying, no, I, that's, a, that's a no. That's a boundary. I, I won't do that. Yeah. What I would say is that people need to define who they really can be or can't be mm. in that marriage. And they can't control the other person, but they can define the terms not only can they, they need to define the terms of their own participation. You know, I worked with one couple, really good couple, very happy couple in a lot of ways. And he just really wanted to expand and open up the marriage. And she said, I'm not even going to judge you for what you want. I love you. But if you go that route, I'm out. I'm not, I don't, I'm not willing to do it. And I'm not even going to sit around and judge your desire for it. I just know that I won't participate. And for him, that was like, he really had to make a decision. Like, what do I want more? And he ultimately said, I want you more. And so he chose monogamy. She wasn't trying to control him. She was controlling herself. Yeah. Yeah. That's Mm -hmm. that's a great example. That's Mm -hmm. a very bad question. What was that was getting at? So (laughs) thank you for Mm -hmm. that. So if a couple is not feeling sexually connected, are there like things they can do in order to get back on track or to, to be able to get themselves in a place where they feel connected um, in that way? Yeah, they can take my enhancing sexual intimacy course. <laughs> they <laughs> <For> sure <starters. laughs> can. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think what, well, I think what happens often in people's relationships is they don't really know why the passion is gone. They don't really understand why the desire is so subdued in the relationship because they felt so much when they were dating or early on in the marriage. So they want it to be good, but they can't figure out what, what's putting the brakes on it. So what I think people need, whether that's through, you know, doing the, a course or it's uh, getting input from a therapist is understanding, you know, there's a kind of an ecology of desire that a lot of times people infect in their marriage unwittingly and make it so that it's very hard for there to be a kind of freedom within their marriage. And I don't mean a freedom to do whatever you want. I mean a kind of sense of emotional freedom uh, within the partnership. So 
when I'm talking about the ways that people will either subjugate themselves to keep the peace or dominate to try to get validation, those are the kinds of very human dynamics that kill desire. They kill anything sort of honest and alive. And so oftentimes sex is the canary in the coal mine around these issues. When you have two people who are able to kind of bring them their best selves, they bring their courage, they bring their self-honesty, they're willing to make room for a partner, even if they're different, even in the ways that they invalidate and still kind of stay true to themselves, that there be, there's an inherent kind of sense of both separateness and togetherness that's really the ideal dynamic of a, an intimate partnership. It's not like I have you in my back pocket. You are your own person, but you're also invested in me. You're not being nice to me just because you're afraid I'll go away. You're kind to me because you're a strong enough person to be invested in my well-being while holding your own. And that's a marker of adult development that a lot of us get tripped up on. We can't quite see our way through it because of the difficulty of tolerating when our spouse won't reinforce us or desire us or, you know, make us feel okay exactly as we are. And so, you know, a lot of the course courses, the, the kind of primary focus of the courses that I teach is about helping people see their own participation in their limiting, in limiting their own development but also limiting their evolution as a marital couple and undermining the honest passion in the marriage. And so when you can see how you're participating in it unwittingly, then it allows you to engage differently and create something that's stronger and is thriving out of something honest and genuine. Oh, I'm ready to sign up for the course because that was <laughs> beautifully put. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of LDS couples, this... I mean, not, not all of them, but a good majority of them, their first sexual encounter is with their spouse, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, when you go through a faith transition, some spouses feel a sense of regret that they weren't mm -hmm. more adventurous before yeah. marriage, that yeah. they're mourning that loss. Is there, is there anything that could help them um, get past some of that regret and that loss that they feel? I think, first of all, it's, I think it's helpful in some ways to normalize that feeling because I think if you feel like, look, I have participated in something that I no longer believe in, but it deeply shaped my choices, the sense of anger or regret is normal. And uh, because you feel like you didn't get to belong to your own choices. Um, and they've had perhaps a cost for you. I think that getting stuck there, of course, in just a sense of resentment and victimhood is costly. Uh, some people do get stuck a bit. Um, and then they stay in their marriage, but they resent their marriage. Or they, you know, they don't really take responsibility for who they're going to be now. I mean, the hard thing about life is you have to live with your choices for good or for ill. And you can only make choices going forward. You can't make choices going backwards. My son actually said something to me. He'd heard it quoted somewhere, but he said something like to forgive forgiveness. I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but he's like, to, forgiveness is to completely give up hope on a different past. And so what that is, is who am I going to be and how am I going to choose going forward? And so that's the critical issue is that, you know, some people may decide this isn't a marriage I can really choose or I, I can't continue to choose the way we're doing the marriage and I, I have to stand up for something healthier or better. Or some people may be able to say, okay, I have some sadness maybe that I didn't get to experience other things, but I don't want to give up what is here that for me is good and that I choose. And, you know, life is about tolerating living within finite choices. You can't have all the things. <laughs> and if you try to have all the things, you often ruin everything. Mm -hmm. And so I think the big issue is what is the choice that I can really live with? What are the losses I can live with? 
But most importantly, it's about asserting yourself into that decision. That's a critical piece. Yeah, that is a critical piece. And, you know, you, when you were talking, it it brought to mind um, two partners that are like low, one that's low libido and then one, one that's high libido, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, that definitely, you know, that can ebb and flow in a marriage. Mm -hmm. Are Mm -hmm. things like masturbation, I mean, how do you talk about some of those things in a low libido, high libido relationship? You, I love all the answers you've given about, you know, your intent and your integrity and, mm-hmm. and your honesty with one another. Is that what you would mm-hmm. still suggest with this? Yes, it is. And I know in some ways these are unsatisfying answers for people who are like, just give me the answer. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, but, you know, honestly, I feel like the happiest people are really, well, let me give, let me give one idea before I say this idea. One is that I think culturally in the church, we grow up in the idea a little bit that our sexuality belongs to our partner, not to ourselves. So your sexuality is made legitimate by your spouse's sexuality or your spouse's desire. That's why there can be so much resentment sometimes when your spouse doesn't desire you because it's their desire. And this is especially true. I think that men can feel this way because men's sexuality is often kind of offered to them as suspect, but if their wife desires them, then it's made legitimate. But if she has her own ambivalence about sexuality or about him, uh, you know, then it invalidates his sexuality. And so he's resentful that she won't legitimize the fact of his sexuality. And so that's a model that I think is designed to fail, even though I understand why we, why we gravitate towards it. Because there's a kind of safety in it. Your sexuality is made legitimate by marriage and by your spouse's desire. It kind of, it's like, a, it, it can give us a kind of sense of security on the front side. The problem with it long term is that we, we grow to resent our spouse when they can't make our sexuality okay. I think we have a responsibility to ourselves and our partnerships to relate to our sexuality in a way that's in line with our integrity and that we are trustworthy around our choices with our sexuality, that who we are is that we, if we want to be trusted, that we function in a trustworthy way. If we want to be clear about the goodness of our sexuality that you don't wait for your spouse to tell you it's good, that you're functioning in a way that you can, in an honest perspective, feel good about, that it's not harmful to anyone, not harmful to yourself. So the questions around masturbation or navigating differences in desire and so on, they really sit on the foundation of your own integrity and how you're in relationship to your sexual nature. And you know, a lot of people want the answers of don't, Yes, do that. Don't do that. But but it all depends on what's informing those choices and why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. And I really appreciate that because this, this goes to a lot of what mixed faith couples do is rely heavily on personal revelation is what I call mm-hmm. it. Right. Yeah. But in personal integrity to know um, how to handle the situation since you're looking at your life through a different paradigm now and everything yeah. changed. And, and because of that, you no longer um, live to that standard that you did before. And, yeah. and it doesn't help that the media tells, us that everyone's having hot sex with each other yeah which (laughs) they're not which they're which they're not (laughs) and and uh our our ideas are so skewed and changed because of that that's right i mean i think it's probably true that people that are strangers um maybe it's kind of hot in the sense of it's not there's high novelty uh, high uncertainty kind of the things that can make sex exciting up front but low meaning And so if you want high meaning, high passion sex, it requires development to be people capable of it. And so sex within a high meaning, high commitment partnership is really the best sex you can have. If you are in a position to really know, love, choose and desire someone and have that reciprocated, that's, that's the best sex there is. 
but it takes something from us and a lot of us don't want to give it. We just want to expect it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great place to end this interview. Love, no choose and desire. Mm. That was excellent way to, to end this. Dr. Jennifer from Lason Fife, thank you so much for joining us on, on Marriage on a Tightrope. I think this will be super helpful for so many out there. And I think that, that your responses gave a lot of deeper meaning and thought to the ideas mm-hmm. behind what we think. And I think that that um, is going to be much more helpful in the long run rather than a yes, you should and no, you shouldn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Right. Thanks for having, thanks for being on the episode. And if you would like to join your course, can you tell them how you, how they can do that? Sure. I uh, just go to my website, which is my name. So finlayson fifecom And then on there, you'll see um, the online courses when you first get on there, there um, and you can learn all about them um, on the website. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on with us. It's, Always a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. 